Um, today's lecture, short lecture, will be about phylogenetics. Um, and as you can see from the right, this is a field that's been along, around for quite a while. Um, so if we go back to what we talked about last week, we talked about biodiversity and how there's all of these different forms of life that we see kind of all over the place today. So as humans, we like to organize things. It's something that we're kind of programmed to do, but we also do this in science. Um, so back in the day, people were doing what we're doing, just not categorizing it into a specific sort of classification system, but they were binning things into similar groups and doing this with things like life as well. So Carl Linnaeus, um, he was kind of the one who established biological nomenclature. And he did that in his 1738 book, Systema Naturae. Um, so this is using the bio binomial system where each species of plant and animal, um, at least at the time, just plants and animals, were given a genus name followed by a species name. And Linnaeus named over 12,000 species of plants and animals. Some of these have been changed today based off of more modern approaches, but a lot of these have remained the same. And largely, this sort of classification is referred to as taxonomy, which is the study of biology concerned with classification. And the other thing that Carl is well known for is grouping humans with animals for the first time. And this proceeded to allow future researchers to look, as, look at humans as a form of evolved animals. So what is biological classification? Well, there's a few different orders that we go through when explaining this. Um, so most commonly, we're, we refer to organisms as, or by their genus species names, if we're using their scientific name. There's also common names, but these aren't what we refer to typically in science. Um, and a general rule, of, not a general rule, a rule that is always followed is genus is always capitalized while the species is lowercase or the first letter of each of these. And both of these are italicized. And I think you can see my mouse. So we have our species level and our genus level. And the higher up we go, um, we have more groups and these include family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, and domain. And each of these groups, the higher up we go, contain more and more organisms. Well, the further down the list we go, we have fewer organisms ending at species. So if we look at this using the common house dog today, we can see it has you know, eight formal names, nine formal names if you include its subspecies. Um, and this helps us group these into their own classification systems and we do this for each organism so if we think of this as kind of what other things could be grouped with the dog we have our higher order classification domain down here and this is our broadest category so we're grouping dogs with plants insects fish all of these different animals in the domain eukarya and there's many more things that are within this domain. Uh, the next step up, we look at Animalia, and we have all of these different animals in this kingdom. And the further up we go, we kind of shrink the list of things that we're grouping the dog with, all the way until we get to the species level, where we group dogs and wolves together, and the subspecies level, where we group just dogs um, and if we take it a step further, we could look at breed of dogs, in this case, a golden retriever. So the tree of life is uh, constructed of three main domains. So earlier we talked about the domain eukarya, which is eukaryota. Um, but there's also bacteria and archaea. So both archaea and bacteria consist of single-celled organisms only. And th 
these organisms vary um, depending on the structure of their cell. So there are a few key differences between archaea and bacteria, but that's nothing that we're going to get into today. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are much more complex, as you can see. There's a lot more going on here. And that's because eukaryotes have more complex cells. And these cells include cell organelles. And there's a few groups of single-celled eukaryotes, but many of these organisms are multicellular. Um, so they contain many cells which have many specific responsibilities for kind of life to actually thrive. And, you know, we're made up of millions of cells. And we're all the way down here with all of these other things made up of many, many cells. Um, and we break eukaryota down into these few main kingdoms, protista, fungi, animals, and plants. And each of these have their own you know, groups, and this could be expanded upon quite drastically, but this is a really simplified explanation of where we see a lot of variation today. Okay, so we've kind of broken down the tree of life. Um, let's talk specifically about phylogenetics, and that is the study of evolutionary history among and between organisms. And this can be explored at different taxonomic levels. Um, so we could look at this through domain or through kingdoms, but we don't get a lot of really intriguing questions if we look at those sort of levels because they're so broad. Um, so oftentimes many scientists uh, will look at relationships between species or be between genera. And oftentimes they'll look at these relationships using phylogenetic trees. Okay, so what is a phylogenetic tree. And there are two types. I guarantee you guys have seen probably be both of these. I don't see how you wouldn't have seen these at some point or another when taking a science class. Um, and we have two types, the rooted tree, which is here on the left, and the unrooted tree, which is here on the right. So the rooted tree has a root, which you can see here. Um, and this is a single lineage at the base, which represents the most common ancestor for all of these organisms here. So A through F. And this tells us about the evolutionary paths over time and the relationships between all of these organisms. So here we uh, know that traits probably evolved here for specifically taxa A and B specifically, that aren't there in any of these other taxa. Um, and we can trace these traits through all of these different branches that we have here. Uh, in contrast, we have an unrooted tree here on the right. And here we don't know what our most recent common ancestor was, so we don't know when traits are arising or not. We don't know what our starting point is. So these trees are useful, but they're useful in a different sort of way where we only can look at the relationships between these trees or between these taxa. Sorry, my cat's playing with the toy now. Um, okay, let's talk about parts of trees. So we have taxa or taxon, which are up here and those are our letters. And these are just the groups of organisms or species that we're using within our tree. And at the top here, we have sister taxa, and those are just species from our like list of taxa that are the most closely related. So A and B are sister taxa, D and C are sister, tax, are sister taxa, and E does not have a sister taxa. Um, e is actually equally related to all of these species. Okay, so we also have clades, and these are branches, um, any branch or lineage that includes its most recent common ancestor. So when I refer to a clade in class, I'm pretty much circling, let's say, A, B, and its node here. I should also probably talk about nodes before I talk about clades. So the node is the splitting point 
between branches where these groups evolve into separate clades. So A and B are a clade right here. D and C are a clade here. But A through D can be a clade if we look at this sort of level where we're looking at everything under and including this most recent common ancestor. We can obviously trace this back further if we want to include E and our node would be located down here. And like I said, these are just splitting events and these represent the most recent common ancestor between all of these organisms. So if we're looking at this tree, the most recent common ancestor between E and A is all the way down here at this node. Whereas if we're looking at between B and A, the most re recent common ancestor is much closer. It's up here at this node. Uh, we also use trees to look at phylogenetic relationships um, and determine relatedness, depict evolutionary history between species, and show the evolution of trait history. So in this case, we are looking at um, how a bunch of traits may have evolved. So we have a bunch of organisms here on the right side at the tips of our branches. Um, and there will always be an organism at your branch tip. And you can see that we're breaking these organisms down into, well, breaking these small clades down into yes or no categories that include this trait I'm showing here above the yes. So anything that's green includes that trait. So rabbits have hair, lizards don't. So we have a splitting event here at this node where we are separating rabbits up top and lizards below. If we go back another node, we have egg with amnion. And we have yes up here where we split rabbits and lizards. And we have no down here where we have frogs. Legs, fish don't have legs, so they're down here on their own. Hinge jaw, lamprey are down here. I think you guys get the message. And if we trace this all the way back, we look at vertebrae column, where the outgroup in this tree is this lancelet, which does not have a vertebrate, whereas all of these other in organisms do. And we can make trees like this using anything. So you will see in class tomorrow, we will be making trees using candy. Um, and we'll look at characteristics of candy and make relationships between those, between like how many of these characteristics evolved. Um, we also will make these trees primarily using the rule of parsimony. So parsimony is out of all possible explanations, the most simplest explanation is the most likely. So I've drawn two trees on the right here where we're looking at the evolution of legs and fur between fish, frogs, bears, and dogs. So on this top tree, I have legs evolving and we're grouping fish into its own category um, and we're separating out frogs, bears, and dogs. Next, fur is evolving. So frogs have their own branch here, and then I'm splitting bears and dogs. So this is a pretty simple explanation as there's only one evolutionary event for fur. Down here, it's a bit more complicated as we're still separating out fish because of legs and grouping all of these in their own node here. But we have two separate events or evolutionary events for the evolution of fur depicted here for bears and here for dogs. And here dogs are more closely related to frogs. So as you can see, this is a scenario where I am showing a more complex phylogenetic tree than the one above. So in class, we'll be attempting to make trees using parsimony as our kind of rule of thumb for simplest explanation is most likely the correct explanation.
but you can also use trees using genetic information. So this is a tree I found from a paper where they have genetic information, so either DNA or RNA sequences for all of these different types of bears, well, and raccoons and lesser pandas. Um, and this information, along with fossil record information, allows researchers to attempt to date when these evolutionary splitting events occurred. So the fossil record is really what's important here for establishing a how long ago these events may have happened. Um, but genetic information generally is a better rule of thumb for establishing this sort of phylogenetic tree compared to the ones that we were looking at previously where we're just looking at uh, trait characteristics. So if we were to look at the lesser panda coat color, that's most closely similar to this brown bear coat color. But obviously, if we look at this tree, there's a lot of things that are more similar to the brown bear than the lesser panda. So we use these rules of thumb when we don't have genetic information, but, and that's what researchers did way back in the day before genetic information was widely available. But now that we do have all this information, there's a lot of revision going on in certain taxonomic groups because we have all this new information. So a lot of trees are being remade nowadays. Um, so that is a really short overview of phylogenetics and expect another lecture for our next class. But this is all you need to know for tomorrow. So see you guys in class.